Okay, so this is an application of the pressure concept. So what she does is, well, she has this glass tube. Inside it, there's no sound. So I will be dubbing it. So inside it, she is putting some merc mercury. This is mercury. Now, the reason why they use mercury is its density is quite high. Well, this is also filled with mercury. So she filled up the whole glass with mercury. She inverted it. And you see there is some, is this air? So let's go back a bit. So is this air over there, do you think? Now what she did was she took a tube which is closed on one end. She filled the tube completely with mercury and she inverted it and put the open end inside the mercury. So do you think I, there can be air over there? Yes, no, I, I don't see your heads. So you, you, you should say yes or no. Who says yes? So where did the air come from? It is closed. It was closed. It was completely filled with mercury. And then the o only one end was open. And that open end was put inside the mercury without letting any air in. Inside mercury? Inside mercury? No. It's almost vacuum. There's no air inside in there because the air was completely emptied. There was no air, on, there was only mercury. And when she inverted it, the level of mercury just went down. Well, you can read the numbers. This is 70, 70, 71, 72, 3, 4. It's around 75 and 76. It's between 75 and 76 centimeters of mercury. So how is this possible? OK, there are two questions. Why doesn't it go down? That is one thing. The second thing, why did it go down? So it was first 100 centimeters of mercury filling all the tube inside of the tube. The tube was filled with mercury. So when she inverted it, the, this column of mercury went down a bit. So why did it go down? One question. And why did it stop over there? Second question. True. So you see, let us sketch it a bit. So sh she had this cup of mer filled with mercury. And inside this cup, she put this tube, which is covered from one end. Initially, it was all filled with mercury, and then the column of mercury, well, you see, if you put an, if an object is at rest, whatever that object is, whether it is a rigid body, a point mass, or a column of liquid, if it is at rest, the net force acting on it should be zero. That is what we have doing since the first week of the, the second week of this course. This is at rest here. So we, that the net force acting on this thing should be zero. Well, in this case, it is easy to identify the forces. One force is its weight 
pushing it downward. The other force is the normal force acting by the staple, pushing it upward. So those two forces should cancel each other so that this can be at rest. Now, the same thing should hold here. Now, if a column of liquid, some volume of liquid is at rest, so the net force acting on that column of liquid should be zero. Now, the forces acting on this column, so let's say, uh, finally, it was here. Now, the, you can just ima consider this column only. It has some a height. Let's say the cross-sectional area of this tube is A. So what are the forces acting on this column? There are two of them. Well, there should be two, so that at least two, so that they will cancel each other. The weight of the mercury, that is the point that is trying to push this column of liquid downward, and the weight of the mercury is the density of the mercury times the volume of the mercury, which is A times H times the G. This is the force pushing the mercury column downward. So this is the weight. On the other hand, there is some pressure at this point. But the pressure at that point is the same thing as the pressure at this point, because we had seen just in the at the end of the last lecture that the pressure at a point is given by the pressure at some reference point plus the density of the liquid times the gravitational acceleration times the height difference between these two reference points. This point and this point, these two points, have the same height. So the h is 0, the height difference is 0. So the pressure at this point and the pressure at this point, they are equal. But that is the outside pressure. So that is, so in this example, h is 0. It is just p0. So the pressure here is nothing but the outside pressure. Now the area is horizontal. We have a pressure over here. So the force that this pressure creates on this area is pointing upwards, perpendicular to the surface. But if it is pointing upwards, it should balance this rho A H G. This should be equal to P0 time. OK, so by the way, this H is the H of mercury, the height of the mercury. This H over here is the difference in the heights of my two points. One point has the pressure P0, the other point has the pressure P. This H is the height of the mercury. So these two forces, do we have any other force, by the way? We should have one more force over here. We have the pressure over here, but we can also talk about the pressure at this point. Let's call the pressure here P prime. Yes. OK, to be pers you are almost correct, but almost. Uh, to be more precise, here it is not pure vacuum. There is some mercury vapor over there, a very small amount of mercury vapor. So that will create a very small amount of pressure over there. But that amount is very small, so and we can ignore it. And in most cases, that is what is done. We will be ignoring the pressure of the mercury vapor over there. In that limit, there is no pressure outside. The P prime is almost 0. <laughs> so this is the equation we have. Well, we can just cancel the A's. And what is left is P0 is equal to rho times g times height of the mercury. Well, you can use this equation in two ways. Well, whenever you have an equation, 
you can either think of, okay, this side is equal, the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, or the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side. So you can use it whichever way you like. So you can use this equation to calculate the height of the mercury column given the outside pressure, or you can use this equation to calculate, this is the outside pressure over here on the surface of the mercury. So you can use this equation to calculate the outside pressure using the height of the mercury column. So let's complete this video. So you see, the height of the mercury column Well, this is the height of the mercury column, so it is almost 35.5, 34.5 millimeters, centimeters. Uh, 34.744 millimeters. Okay, so that is kind of the old everything. So in that example, at least, H mercury is equal to 744 millimeters. So to calculate the pressure, you can just take the density of mercury. Well, this is the row of mercury. The density of mercury multiplied with the gravitational acceleration 9.8 meters per second squared times the height of the mercury column, and you will obtain the pressure. Now, what is the unit of pressure? P0, we had just seen that it can be written as rho mercury, H of mercury times rho. Now, what is the unit of pressure? Naldo? Uh, yes, that is a G. Well, the unit of mercury, well, we define the, mer the unit of pressure, sorry. The unit of pressure, we define the pressure as the force divided by area. So this is one unit of pressure, newtons per meter squared. Another unit of pressure, you see here, if you look at here, the pressure density of mercury is more or less constant. So wherever you go, that is, a, that is just a constant. This is just a constant on the surface of the Earth. So whenever you measure the height of the mercury column, you also measure the pressure. So that is another unit used. This is one unit. Another unit that you use is the millimeter mercury. So you probably have some relative who has uh, low, pr low blood pressure or high blood pressure problem, right? I mean, I'm sure all your grandparents, at least one of your grandparents, is forcing you to measure their blood pressure from time to time, no? Who doesn't have such a relative? Now, if you read uh, the scales over there, the unit there is always millimeter mercury. Right, the unit of the blood pressure, that, that is what is commonly used. When they say that the, the, your highest blood pressure should be around 12. 12 is 12 millimeter Hg. And the lowest should be around 8, 8 millimeter H mercury. So that is the unit used on those uh, devices. And if you just imagine the atmosphere, 760 
744 millimeter HG. Well, if you do that ex experiment close to a seaside and at the height seaside at a reasonable temperature, not in a lab in I don't know where, you will get that the P0 is one atmosphere. So that is the atmospheric pressure, which is defined as, let me check, this is 1.013 times 10 to the power 5 newtons per meter squared. This is the, pr the atmospheric pressure. By the way, this newtons per meter squared is also defined as the Pascal. Now this is the relative scale. Now this corresponds to 760 millimeter Hg. Okay, so now one question. If the blood pressure is, the highest blood pressure you have for a normal person is 12 millimeters Hg compared to 760 millimeters Hg outside, then the pressure inside your blood veins is so low. So low, such a low pressure. You should be squeezing in if the blood pressure is so low. If you cut your uh, veins, the blood comes out because of the blood pressure. I don't know if you have seen any one of these uh, bloody movies. If you cut an artery, the, the blood just flows out. So if the pressure of the blood is so low, why does it flow out? What which force causes it to flow out? The heart, but the, the pressure that you measure, the 14 millimeter Hg from these uh, these devices, tells you that the pressure created by you, the, blood, the heart is just 14 millimeters Hg. And your friend told me that it is very low compared to the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure in my blood is much lower than the atmospheric pressure. Now, the atmospheric pressure is trying to push air inside my veins. The heart is trying to push the blood out of my veins to the other parts of the body. So if the pressure of the heart is so low, just 14 millimeters Hg, then there is no way that the blood is getting out. Well, the reason is the 14 millimeters Hg, the pressure in your blood is not really 14 millimeters Hg. It is 14 millimeters Hg or 12 millimeters Hg if you are, your pre, uh, blood pressure is normal. 12 millimeters Hg plus this number. So the blood pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. And the difference is what you measure by those instruments. So that is why that 12 millimeter Hg difference, the difference created by your heart, is causing all these blood to flow out. I mean, if you cut one of the arteries, it's just in a, in a matter of minutes that you will lose all your blood. So that is called the, you see, we said that P at a given point is P0 plus rho GH for a liquid. This is for a liquid. And this is called the gauge pressure. Or the pressure that you measure by these uh, instruments. They tell you this gauge pressure. So if you, let's say, if you are, in Ang if you are living in Ankara, there tomorrow there is the new year. So if you, any one of you is going to Istanbul, Mersin, to any uh, seaside, nobody, everybody is here studying physics. Okay, so if after your finals, if you go back to your hometown and your hometown is not Ankara and you are on the seaside, if you measure your blood pressure before going there and you measure it after going there, you will discover that your blood pressure there is lower than your blood pressure here. Now, that's the problem I have whenever I go to Mersin. My blood pressure gets so low that I, I, can, I just cannot wake up. 
That is not because my heart is functioning differently here than in Mersin, but mainly the pressure difference between Ankara and Mersin are different. Ankara is at a height of around 500, kilo 500 meters from the sea level. So the height between here and Mersin is around 500 meters. Well, the atmosphere, although it's a gas, we can just, and the, all the derivation here, we can apply also to the atmosphere. So the height difference between here and Mersin is 500 meters. Well, the atmosphere has a lower much lower density than mercury, but nevertheless, it has some finite density. So we have the density of the hair, the density of the uh, gravitational acceleration, and the H. H is 500 meters. So the pressure in Mersin is much higher than the pressure in Ankara. So if the pressure in Ankara, if the outside pressure uh, is much higher over there, my blood pressure will be more or less the same. So the pressure difference between my blood and the outside pressure will be lower in Mersin. So when I measure my blood pressure in Mersin, I get a lower value. And it takes me a few days to adjust to the new air pressure. That is, my, blood, my heart needs to adjust to the new air pressure. It has to be pumping stronger. It has to create a larger blood pressure so that it will be able to flow through my veins. So that, that's the, the reason why the heart creates this pressure, is that without that pressure, the blood will not be able to flow through the veins. So just imagine it's just a tube, and you are squeezing the tube. The, the atmospheric pressure, what it does is it is trying to squeeze your veins. If the heart cannot create enough pressure, it will not be able to open up the veins, so that the blood will not be able to flow through the veins. Well, there is another unit that you see quite often whenever you are discussing the pressure. It is the bar. Well, this number is not. Well, th this is the typical pressure that you will be feeling. Uh, uh, whenever you have an instrument that creates some pressure, lowers the pressure, typically you compare it with the outside pressure, the atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere. But this number, we like round numbers. We don't like these 0 0.1.013 times 10 to the power of 15. So what to do about that? Just throw it away. And one bar is defined as 10 to the power of 5 Pascal. That's 10 to the power of 5 Newtons per second squared, Newtons per meter squared. This is the definition. That's the definition of the bar. You just so one atmosphere is more or less one bar. Now let us see some applications of okay, let, let us do some exercise. A few exercises. One thing is the aquariums. Have you got have you been to a large aqua aquarium somewhere? Well, there is, there is one also in uh, Panora. So have you been to Panora? Did you check the size of the glasses, the width of the glasses? This much. This much. Yeah. If you go to one side, you will really see that it is this side. It's a huge glass. But you need a huge glass, otherwise it will break. Well. Then there is the, all the technical complications. If you have such a huge glass, it will most of the time it will not be transparent. So it should be a high purity, very thick glass, so that it will be still be transparent, although it is so thick. Now the reason why it should be so thick is it has to balance all the force of the water in the liquid in the aquarium. So the question is, how much force should they bear? What is the force? By the way, just that we just started discussing about the glasses. When, if you are interested in telescopes, I know that some of you are interested in telescopes, making observations. The large telescopes always ha use a mirror. They do not use a glass lens or uh, some other material. The main problem using with such lenses is if you want to look at very far, far away distances, the glass have to be the lens have to be thin on the outside. 
and that is where you are holding it. But it gets too heavy. So it is thin, it starts to get too heavy beyond a certain size that uh, glass lenses are not practical. You cannot construct them. So that's why, that's one of the reasons why the large telescopes are always uh, mirror telescopes. Now let's come back to our problem. So let us suppose that we have this aquarium window. It is filled with water, with some liquid, up to some height, H, H. So the question is, what is the total force exerted on this liquid, on this glass? By the liquid only. The net force is zero, by the way. She's right. The net force is zero because what you want is you want the glass to stay there. You don't want the glass to accelerate some, somewhere else. So the edges and the outside atmosphere, you should make sure that some other structure in your construction provides this force. So it will be, the ed you have to be holding the edges. So the edges should be exerting some force on the glass to hold it there. So what you would like to know is how much force you should be exerting on the glass to hold it there. But that force should be equal to the force that the water exerts. And now that's, that's the question. How much force does the water exert on the glass? How can we proceed? OK, any suggestions? Well, we, we already know the pressure. The, let's say the outside pressure is P0. So P0, P pressure at a given height is P0 plus rho GH. This is the pressure, the pressure we know. And now? OK, without solving this pressure, don't construct an aquarium. You will break it. Sorry? OK, that, that's good. We know that the force is equal to the pressure times the area. So let's say this is the length L. So is it we know the pressure times area is L times H. So this will be equal to, uh, by the way, let me call this, uh, let me change this one to D. This will be equal to P0 plus rho GH times L times D. H, what is H? A small, which distance? So whenever you have such a result, always think of this. Eventually, even if you have some uh, symbolic calculation, eventually you will need to put in some numbers. Now, let's look at these numbers. L is a number you can measure in the aquarium. Just take a measuring tape. You measure the width. L we know. D is a number we can measure. Just take your measuring tape. That is your D. P0. Well, in the video, it is already measured. It was at least, if we are using the same room, it is 744 millimeters H mercury. So P0, we know. Rho, that is the rho of the water. We can measure it. It is al almost one, one kilograms per liter. G, we know. We can put some number over there. What is H? So this equation doesn't have any meaning. It was it was kind of on the right track. We know the pressure. So given the area, we can calculate the force. But then the, we had this pr problem. Throughout this area, pressure is not constant. When we were describing being the pressure as force over area, we were assuming that the area was small enough so that the pressure doesn't change throughout the, that small area. But in this case, the area is quite large. And it starts from h equal to 0 h to h equal to d. And definitely, the pressure is changing. So we cannot directly use this relation.
because the, throughout the area, the pressure is changing. Any suggestions? Well, D is not small. I mean, we have this aquarium over there. We don't have. We we are not free to make an assumption that D is small. Uh, if you go to Panora, D is larger than L. D is around three meters. L is also more or less three meters. So those are the numbers we are trying to aim. But you see, the problem here was the pressure changes from this over this area. But we can still divide this large area into smaller areas in which the pressure doesn't change. In that case, for each one of these smaller areas, we can use this relation to find the force acting on that very small area, and then we can just sum all those forces to obtain the total force. So, okay, let, let, let us just erase this part. So what we do is we are just dividing this large area into very small segments. Well, the small, I can just imagine very small uh, squares, but I also don't need that because I know that the pressure changes only with the H. So I can just divide all my area into small, uh, very small areas which have the same H. So if within my area H doesn't change, then I can just assume that the pressure is constant within that small area. Now, the regions of constant height are just these narrow strips. Let us just imagine that this is my z-axis. Now, each one of these strips has an area, dA, very small area. So that's why I use the dA. dA is L times dZ. That is the very small area. The force acting on that very small area will be just P0 plus rho GH times L dZ. I know that within that very small area, H is almost constant. And in fact, H is equal to, well, remember, H is the distance from the surface of the liquid. It is not that this Z. So if I take, if I imagine taking in, into account this area over here, the height will be nothing but D minus z. That is the height from the top. Well, the total force, well, I know that all of these areas will be feeling a force out of the blackboard, uh, out of the screen. They are all in the same direction. So since they are all in the same direction, the net force will also be out of the screen. So, and the magnitude of that force will be just the sum of all these small forces. This will be equal to, well, the sum of very infinitely many, very small numbers is just my integral, P0 plus rho G H, well, H, no, H is D minus Z, L, D, Z. Now the z starts from 0 and goes up to d. This is the total force that the glass should support, the glass of my aquarium. Now a, a typical like, aquarium, let's say 1 meter squared. Let us just put in some numbers over here. Uh, 
Okay, there is one thing though. If you imagine this glass, there is pressure from the liquid, which is given by this expression. There is also some atmospheric pressure from the outside. So there is already these two forces acting on the liquid. You don't need to do anything to take into account. The, uh, this outside pressure is already there. There is a pressure of the liquid given by this. There is a pressure from the outside. Well, the pressure from the outside is just a constant. The pressure is constant through. Uh, you can just say that the pressure on the, this area is just constant, the atmospheric pressure. It is always P0. But this is just, just this P0 L times dz is the outside pressure, outside force. So if you just look at it from the side, this is the side. So this, this is my d. So there is this force that we denoted ft. There is the external force already, f atmosphere. And if atmosphere is nothing but P0 LD. Now, the difference in these two forces, Ft minus F atmosphere, which is from 0 to D, rho G, D minus Z, LDZ, this is the additional force you need which should be provided by the structure of your system. When you are uh, building this uh, aquarium, you have to make sure that well, this glass will be holding, holded by the frame of your aquarium. You can just imagine you, this can be, I don't know, a hole in the wall. You put the glass over here. The water is it pushing it outside. The air is pushing it inside. These are uh, un, uh, these two forces will not be equal due to the liquid inside. So you have to hold this glass. You have to create some additional force acting on this glass, which will be equal to this number. Now let us calculate that number. Well, if you calculate that number, you will find that that is nothing but rho g d squared L over 2. No, not dz, no. This is what you would get. In your calculus courses, you have already seen how to calculate integrals, so I can just write down the results now. Let's put some numbers. What is the density of water? One what? One tons per centimeter cube? One? One kilograms per met meter cubed? OK, so what is the density of water? You all agree that it is one, but one what? One kilogram per meter cube. Okay, have you ever car carried one liter? Hmm? Yes. Okay. You see, you buy b uh, one liter bottles, right? Come on, you, ha you are buying water. You have that bottle of water over there. How? What is this volume? It is 500, half a liter. And how much does it weigh? Grams, half a kilo. Half a kilo, five, half a liter. So it is one kilo per liter. How big is one liter? Now, one meter cube, OK, you, you, you first said that one kilogram per meter cube. OK, so one meter is more or less this size. So I just imagine it, this size water, this size water, and this size water. That is one meter cube. And well, you said that that is half a kilo. OK, so this big cube 
of water cannot be one kilo, twice that much, no. This is one ton. One, one ton per meter cube, 10 to the power three kilograms per meter cube. Well, the rho is 10 to the power three kilograms per meter cube, cubed. What is G? Let's just take it 10 unit meters per second squared. So times 10 meters per second squared. OK, what is the typical size of an aquarium? What size of an aquarium would you like to calculate this for? Let's do the, the one in the panora. What do you think is the sizes? Well, typical, let's say, five and three. Five squared times three meters cubed. Five squared 25 times three is 75 meters squared. No, okay, yeah, meter cubed. This d squared L will be five squared 25 times three, 75. Let's just round it 100 meter cubed. Divided by two. This is, this is equal to, well, 10 to the power three, 10 to the power four, five, six, uh, this will cancel. 10 to the power 6 divided by 2, or 5 times 10 to the power 5 newtons. Uh, we have kilogram meters per second squared. This is the for the Panora Aquarium. Well, 5 times 10 to the power 5 is the weight of 50 tons. If you have some, something that weighs 50 tons, this will be its weight. So the glass over there has to be able to carry 50 tons. Uh, 50 tons is huge. Well, a, a, a typical home aquarium will probably be like one meter, 50 centimeters. So one meter, let's say, D is one over two. Well, let me copy this. So this is for a home aquarium. OK, the density is 10 to the power 3 kilograms per meter cubed. G is 10 meters per second squared. D for a home aquarium is 1 over 4 plus 2 times 1 over 4 divided by 2 is 1 over 8. Let's just approximate it by 1 over 10. Uh, meter squared, L is one, so one meter. This is 10 to the power three newtons. That is how much the glass in a home aquarium should support. This is the weight that it should support. Well, 10 to the power three newtons is the weight of 100 kilos. So on the average, if two of you just step on that glass, the glass shouldn't break. That is how much weight it should be able to support. Okay, any questions before we give a break? Uh, the glass breaks easily, but it can also be able to support very large weights. <laughs> 